No, we have none. No homework. No, nothing yet. Nope, you're all good. Uh, uh, um. Shiny. Yeah. Maybe you might remember. Was it Coke or Pepsi? Oh, um, I do. I like Cherry Pepsi better than Cherry Coke, but I like Coke more than Pepsi. I don't know what the and but I'm not a crazy guy. Like I don't like orange. Like you know how they like make Coke with orange and like. No, the lime, the lime Pepsi, or the, is it the lime Pepsi? Some people really like the vanilla, yeah. Yeah. Oh, and Cherry Dr. Pepper. Um, I do like Cherry Dr. Pepper, and I'm not a Dr. Pepper fan. I think that's like a Southern kind of drink. Um, do you? Oh, like you can make it all on your own kind of thing? Okay, let's see here. Can people ask for whatever they want, basically? And then, can I have Pepsi? Oh, yeah, that classic line of doing it that way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, let's see here. Okay, I don't know how to do this. I'm learning. Just give me a chance here to. I will find some music to watch again. The recording always starts with you staring at the iPad. I know, I know, I know, I know. Yeah, it's one of those things that. I know, so I'm getting better. Look, I've got a pencil. We're getting there, we are getting there, we are getting there, exactly. Like, you might think I just sit in my office all day, watch movies, then just like, you know, roll out of bed, come on over here, and then, uh, no. See, I'm actually thinking, let's see here. Okay, so my videos will be better now too because I did do last week's, but uh, it wasn't very good. Um, so, and I'll make this presentation. Obviously, the um, video and audio will be recorded using the. Um, I'll post it on YouTube, but I'll also make the presentation available as well. So, this is the fourth lecture. Um, I'm not sure. Like at least two or three of you have asked me, like, when's our first assignment or something. I can't tell if you're like super eager to have an assignment that I'm like falling short or if you're just so used to having assignments in other courses I'm not sure what the room is the feeling of the room is here but um dude we're gonna have it very soon um right I'm just trying to get through I, I mean the other part of me too is I don't want to give you an assignment if I don't have time to possibly even grade it uh and I'm trying to get through my tenure package which is due in two weeks so it's pointless for me to give you an assignment and then I sit on it for three weeks. Like, why did I make you do it now? Because I'm presuming you've probably got an exam or something in some other class. So why not give you time to do that? And we'll kind of go through. Okay. What is this? This, what is this? Does anyone want to take a guess of what this is? What is this? No, I wasn't showing you. Nope, this happened uh, Wednesday, uh, yesterday, uh, and Tuesday, and Monday, because I was thinking about this lecture, and, you know, I start off with what the news is that I'm interested in. What is this 
apocalypse, apocalyptic kind of thing showing us. Nope. Is it the what? The smile. Um, nope, not Smile Direct Club. Nope. Of what? It's an interest rate of something. What could this possibly be? Very closely linked to it. This, my friends, is an incredibly worrisome sign. So what happened here? is let's see so this would be what looks like it was the 17th by my best guess right 17th was what day monday was it monday or tuesday tuesday yep so yeah it would have been tuesday yeah it would have been tuesday okay started on monday obviously we see this increase from about a level 2.25 percent to all of a sudden six percent on monday then you notice that's kind of like a straight line markets closed at that point that gets us to the 17th where it then shoots up to 10 percent so uh, does let me write on this at the same time does not okay <laughs> this is the repo market this is the asset repurchase market you probably, I mean, what? Again, how many? You're almost all, almost all of you are business majors. Almost all of you. Are there any of you that are finance specifically? No. Okay. Well, okay. So let me go with this. Um, the, and you, you may have heard of this before, but this is called um, the repo market. I uh, mean, um, at the end of every close of business of the market, um, the reserves have to go somewhere. And there are banks that end up needing money and there are banks that end up being able to lend money. What was kind of commonly called the overnight rate. And something incredibly scary started to happen on Monday and really happened on Tuesday that hasn't happened since the 2007 crisis. So let's look at this. This is uh, from the Bloomberg terminal. This is the overnight repo rate. Now, again, I'm gonna explain what this market does in a little bit more detail here, but dude, look at this. this so, that, so this one was only giving you back to the beginning of the month, right? This is giving you since uh, 2015. Now you see this slight upward trend. That's nothing too concerning. And the reason for that is linked to the idea that since 2015, interest rates have been going up. That was the time when the Federal Reserve did start to increase interest rates. And you see this weird little thing that happened in 2019, end of 2018, 2019. That was the point where the markets were getting kind of really scary at the end of the year, last year beginning of this year, mm, it looks pretty bad, but it's nothing as bad as what we just saw. Um, yeah. Um, let's, it's gonna let me look at this. <coughs> <laughs> Let's see if it lets me look at this. Uh, it's not going to let me look at it. Okay. Uh, let's see here. Uh, is there another uh, I don't think there's another way to look at it. Okay. Let's go back to. Seriously, you're not gonna let me get out of this thing now? Um, okay, let's go back to. Let's go to.
Look at that. Can you, oh man. If I can erase this here. And that look. So let's talk about what the repo market is. Okay. So the idea is that you've got two sides of the market here. Okay. You've got um you've got banks that are supplying cash. You've also got banks that are owning this, but this is not just banks. This is not just like Banco or First Hawaiian that are the players in this repo market. In the repo market, you've got investment banks like Goldman Sachs, like B of A, Bank of America. Um, you've got um, very large players in this uh, repo market. And Connected to that, what we have is this idea that I want to make sure I correctly state this here. Cody, we met, oh, let's see if Cody gets. Uh, well, let's see here. Can I find this? No. It really doesn't want to get out of that. Okay, let me do this. Oh, oh, wait, no, actually, I don't know. So the repo market, you've got treasuries, mortgage-backed securities, incredibly stable bonds, equities, that serve as collateral for me borrowing money from you, whether you're the bank or someone who's just got a lot of extra cash sitting around. And what you do is you, let's say you're the bank, and you've got some extra cash sitting around, and I need your cash, that I would say, dude, give me some cash overnight. I'll pay you some interest. And this isn't just like a trust kind of thing. I will give you these treasury bills that I own, because that's the, usually the biggest asset um, for these individuals. And they're, obviously, there's no risk inherent in them. And that they hold these treasuries overnight, or for however long you want the loan, they get a slight interest rate and the bank's happy because now their cash that was just sitting there is now earning them some money. What that means is that sorry, I'm not trying to make you be um, sitting on my every word here. I'm trying to get my access I wonder what do now. Do it. Okay, never mind. Again, same thing. Yes, I'm not sharing my screen. What about you, Cody? What do you think here? What does that picture mean to you? That picture. Yeah, this is our repo market. What this means is that on Monday, banks were requiring 
someone to pay 10%, the equivalent of a 10% APR on an overnight loan. That means that banks have one of two issues going on. Either, and this is the best case scenario, either they've run out of cash to lend out, right? And they just, the cash is so scarce, they have to charge this really high rate. Or worst case scenario, and this is what happened in the 2007, 2008 crisis, worst case scenario, they don't trust either the person that's on, that's asking for the money, or they don't trust the, co the strength of the collateral that's being exchanged for it. Both of those are pretty bad situations, but that's exactly what happened in the 2008 financial crisis, right? Where you had both people saying, Bear Stearns, I don't trust that, right? And that bank, that is what ended up causing Bear Stearns to be bought out um, in March of 2007, is that the repo market would not supply the needed money to Bear Stearns. And you can't run an investment bank if you don't have access to this repo market. And the repo market is trust. You need, and, and, and the 2007, 2008 crisis, um, there was a loss of liquidity. When we say there's a loss of liquidity, it's exactly this chart. This market, the repo market, is what gives our entire economy all its liquidity. This is, this is how the economy is running. If you, I don't know why this chart looks like this, uh, but if you don't have this market working properly, all of the credit flows in the economy freeze, which is exactly what happened after Lehman Brothers failed. The fall of that investment bank, I don't, we don't have the data that goes back that far, but I'm sure we can find it, but that is, Right, the um, failure of that market. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry? So, oh, geez. it really wants to do this. Okay. Um, <laughs> so, here's what's going on in the repo market you've got, and we saw this. Um, I'm going to skip ahead a slide here. Look at this, right? I mean, so I'm, I'm, you know, so in doing this, I'm answering your question here. Um, we already have seen that banks have excess reserves, meaning they've got lots of extra cash sitting around. This cash sitting around does not make them money, right? So they want to be able to find a market. Now remember, they have pretty strict regulations about what they can do with this money. They can't just go out in the stock market and buy stocks. Um, but they can lend out money overnight. I mean, they could borrow it too if they wanted to, but if they're borrowing money, they're in a pretty bad financial state of affairs. So banks have all of these excess reserves. They can lend out. They can lend it out overnight. They can, it's called, sometimes the repo market's called the overnight rate, the overnight market. It's just an old term. You can, the bank, the, the loan terms can be longer than overnight. Um, but then the question is, is who's asking for the money? The, um, primarily speaking, um, it's, um, you know, it, it could be investment banks that are asking for the money uh, to do their normal operations. Also, one of the other supplier of reserves would be money market funds. So think about what a money market fund does. Um, some of you, your checking account or your savings account at the bank is actually a money market account, meaning it's an investment fund. And what that means is that the investment firm will invest your dollar to try to get you back a dot that accounts for exactly a dollar. How can they make any money doing that? Is because right they lend the money out to other places and make some interest <coughs> and then can use that some interest for the money market fund. Um, so oh I see because I'm happy. 
So, let's see. Go on. Yep. So basically, um, tons of extra reserves and money banks have. So to make them, they're going to it. They're not making any money. That's why they want to temporarily lend out their money. They are going to be lending out their money. Yep. Make at least something, even if it's a small amount. Mm-hmm. Right. That's what that is. Yes. And what? So, so you so far you said investment banks. Mm-hmm. Take their money. And those would be the primary players. So going back to, I mean, what we see here is we've got, and I wanted to make sure. Think of the that interest rate that we saw. I don't want to go back to it. So you can share that screen again. Um, think back to what the interest rate was that it was targeting, about 2.25%. What that represents is how, it's kind of like the base interest rate in our economy. Because if you think about it, an overnight loan where the collab, you're only asking for a loan overnight from a very credit worthy borrower, and they're only asking for, uh, right, and they've got pretty good collateral standing behind it, that's pretty much the lowest interest rate you're going to get out there in the world, right? And everyone else is going to have to charge a higher interest rate, right? Because this is kind of like wholesale cost if you're a store, right? Or, you know, the, um, the cost to the producer um, if you're anyone else. What that means here is that then someone's going to need money, right? So what do they need um, the money for? Right is it's not gonna let me write on this. Um, but these excess reserve uh, it's not gonna let me write that. It's really not gonna let me. Let's go back to this. The two percent two point two five percent. Yep. Yeah. Um it's the risk free rate, yeah. So if it's 2.25, right, if it's 2.25 and overnight it shoots up to 10, as I was saying here, what that represents is, in essence, if there's two sides to this market, is that there's either too little cash, right, or too many T-bills, right? One or the other. That's best case scenario, right? Because worst case scenario is none of this shit matters because no one trusts anyone. Then it doesn't matter what the interest rate is. So what's being played out right now is the Federal Reserve is saying, don't worry, the 10% is just a technical problem that temporarily created a situation where there was too little cash. So it was this, there was this weird confluence of events last week. Um, so for you accountants in the room, um, quarterly payments were actually due, I believe this week or last week, um, quarterly tax payments for corporations. Um, okay, so that means you've already got a lot of cash exiting the market at that point, right? And it's going to US Treasury. Okay. Two, uh, there was a pretty big bond auction last week that finally settled. And when that settles, you basically, those who bought the bonds actually have to turn over the cash. Okay, that's two pretty big things going on there. And then three, we've got this kind of longer term thing where um, we're no longer doing uh, quantitative easing. And what that means, what that quantitative easing means is that there is, there are, there's less cash out there. 
uh, the Federal Reserve is, as bonds are coming due, they are uh, tearing up the cash, basically. So one of the slides here, um, if it will show you here, I think it will eventually. Um, Um, but what you would see here, maybe you won't. Oh, you do. It's just slow. Sorry, I'm learning. Uh, you see this end of quantitative easing right here, right? So you do see a decline in reserves, meaning a decline in cash. Then think of it again, you've got all this cash leaving the market. And so what the Federal Reserve is telling us right now is don't worry. This is just a weird confluence of events that all happened this week that caused that scary thing. The question is, do you believe it? What happened here is, uh, let's see, well, let me draw. Let's... I don't think it'll let me. Okay, I won't. Uh, anyway, uh, the reason why this is uh, somewhat scary is because to get this down back to its normal level, uh, required $128 billion in extra cash being supplied by the Federal Reserve um, on Wednesday morning. So to remove that problem, you pumped in, uh, for the first time since the 2007-2008 crisis, uh, the Federal Reserve pumped money into this market to stabilize it. So this is the first time since the 2007-2008 crisis that the repo market has failed, which is what this basically represents is a failure of the repo market. Um, so it took $128 billion to fix this problem. But some people think the problem itself has not been removed because on Wednesday, the Federal Reserve made a decision to do what? what the Federal Reserve? To lower interest rates. This interest rate is supposed to be within that target, and it certainly isn't, right? Because it's about where it was before. Meaning, um, the way that this kind of thing looks is, so we have an interest rate target, meaning the Federal Reserve is trying to reach the target of what they announced. That would mean that if it's a target, there's an upper bound and a lower bound. We've been pretty good about being in the middle of that. Now, we're on the upper end of that um, tail. Well, I think that's me just kind of look at that. Um, so, what does that mean for us? Um, what that means is there's a concern. Obviously, the concern here would be loss of liquidity. But the other concern is maybe the Federal Reserve has no clue anymore um, how to do this. Like, why didn't they fix the problem on Monday? Because the problem actually first emerged on Monday. Um, does anyone know who is running the, who would care about this market? Which of the, who within the Federal Reserve manages this market. There's only one person, and it's probably not who you think it is. But you should still take a guess. Don't make me be discouraging. Take a guess of who within the Federal Reserve runs this market. You might know his name. It's a him. It's a him. Anyone want to take a guess? It is not Jay Powell, no. It's actually someone more powerful than Jay Powell within the Federal Reserve. And you would think that Jay Powell is actually the most powerful because he's chair of the Federal Reserve. But he's actually chair of the Federal Reserve Board of Governors. 
which of the 12, so the Federal Reserve has 12 districts, which of the 12 districts is the most important? Yeah, it's a good question. That's a, that's a perfectly respectable question to ask, actually. Okay, so the map is drawn back in 1913. Um, so it's all screwed up because it's all East Coast heavy here. So you might remember this from back in 131. We are part of, in this Hunger Games, we are part of District 12. Um, yeah, we're part of District 12. I used to work for District 7. Um, which of these, and the star there at DC, that's where the Board of Governors is. So that star basically regulates, is kind of like the boss of the other 12, or at least we'd like to think they're the boss of the other 12. But what I'm, and what I'm saying here is, is, is with some, a little bit of controversy here, what I'm saying to you of those 12, one of those numbers is more important than the other. Which, do you want to guess who might be more important than the other? Exactly. Two is the most important, uh, the New York Federal Reserve. Because the New York Federal Reserve has a unique task. So the New York Federal Reserve is actually always on the um, FOMC, the Federal Reserve Open Market Committee. And the reason why, so the, the, um, the FOMC, which is what determines the, um, in this case here, um, basically the interest rates, the federal funds rate, has the seven board of governors, that means the seven people who live in the star, and then it has always the New York Federal Reserve, and then four rotating among the remaining 11. Um, and the reason why number two is always in there is because it's supposed to be closest to the markets. It's supposed to understand what's going on in the markets, and so basically, the person who runs number two should have known that this was going to get fucked up pretty fast. Because, right, I mean, again, I'm not a super smart guy here, right? But if the people who work for me came to me on Monday and said, dude, look at this chart. And it was just like, right, like the part where right before it hits that peak on Tuesday, Monday, the problem should have been known. It shouldn't have taken until Wednesday to fix the problem. So. Who runs number two? Who runs number two? Should kind of know him. It's not the guy who wrote the soundtrack for Star Wars, who I'm sure will be the first person shown. No, we want the the Fed or John. Yeah, the, we want the Federal Reserve. And I'm just going to look here very quickly here. I'll just see if we can see a critique of him. It's not going to take too long. But the reason why he's kind of important, too, is because, okay, I'm going to click videos. Could be offensive. Um, we're not watching a 59-minute as much as I like the guy. Uh, but he actually used to run our district, District 12. Um, he's huge Republican, so Trump appointed him to number two. So that's kind of a way of of um, Trump getting who he wants in the FOMC, right? Because otherwise, number 12 is not going to be in there all the time, right? And since John Williams is such a strong Republican, he wants the Republican that he wants in number two. Okay. That's fine if he knows a lot about the markets. But John Williams represents the first time someone who doesn't even own a Bloomberg terminal, which is kind of a Again, I, you know me, I'm already kind of the big advertiser of these terminals, but like, dude, you can't be like a market trader and not know how to use one or not even have one. And the person at the New York Fed's always had one. And so now all of a sudden they don't have one. Um, so it seems a little odd. Um, and I'm trying to see, you know, we can't find anything incredibly great here, but. What is that? What does country music, a film by Ken Burns, have to do? Um, 
Oh yeah, and he made this really bad mistake back in June. I forgot about that. Um, I'm not watching a seven minute speech. Um, but basically, this guy, the guy with glasses, should have known um, that there was going to be this problem, and he didn't. And the best that he could do is um, tell the markets on Tuesday night, we'll fix it when the markets open on Wednesday, which actually did make the problem not as bad as it was. Because again, you do see that the problem largely fixes itself, um, uh, fixes itself pretty quickly after the markets open. Um, but it's still pretty bad. Um, I wish, let's see here. Let's see if I can get to the video. Will it let me? I'm going to work this. Actually, I know how to get it. Um, okay, I actually know. I figured it out. This is important because it, it's going to, I still want to get to Levi's question because I feel like I haven't fully answered Levi's question here about what the repo market's doing for us here. But just to illustrate why, uh, well, uh, let's see, who among you looks like the most businessy around here? Cody, I'm going to guess you haven't heard of the business of the repo market. Uh, what about the accountants in our row twos and threes? What about any of you guys? No? Repo market? Repo market? Yeah. That's a shame. Why Why aren't they teaching you about the repo market? Because it is very important. Um, uh, Yep, so let me answer that while I'm typing this in. Um, so again, you, basically the only borrowers in this repo market is, one, you have to be an extremely big player, pretty big player, meaning you're either a bank, a retail depository bank, or you are a investment bank. Um, or you're what's considered a primary dealer. To be considered a primary dealer means that you deal with a lot of U.S. treasuries. So an example of a primary dealer would be Warren Buffett. Warren Buffett doesn't run an investment bank. He's not a depository bank. But his firm, Berkshire Hathaway, is the largest non-public owner of U.S. treasuries. So you have to either be a primary dealer, an investment bank, or a depository bank. Or you are the Federal Reserve, or you are the federal government. So those are the actors, okay? Now, again, you divide every actor into the two sides of the market. All that the repo market is designed to do is it's designed to find an equilibrium price for short-term borrowing overnight, okay? And the reason why you need that money doesn't really matter. Because you're a big bank or you're a big institution, no one's going to ask you what you're using the money for, like if you went to the bank and asked for a car loan. But when the reason why car loans are so cheap is because there's collateral, right? Just like house loans, there's collateral. And that's exactly what also has to exist in this repo market. So in some sense, when someone dis figures out that they need money and they need like two million dollars three million dollars the only place you're going to get three million dollars for let's say a 12-hour time period is this repo market they need the money right they've got accounts they've got trades that have to be settled there's some reason why they need the money let's not worry about why they need the money but the fact of the matter is they need the money now 
the only way that someone will lend you the money is because you say, I'm going to pay you interest. And there's a risk, however very slight, that the bank could fail overnight, right? Because you're asking it for cash. So it's not like you're totally good and live a clean life, right? You must need it. You must need something for some reason. So, um, right. So you decide then at that point that you, um, you know, that you're going to have to um, give it some collateral. And the only kind of collateral that's going to be trusted are, now here's where I'm going to add something to this here. The primary ones would be U.S. Treasuries. Of course, those are incredibly highly liquid, and they're obviously pretty, pretty risk-free. But the other thing that can be accepted are mortgage uh, bonds from Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. As you can kind of see, when we had 2008, 2007, 2008 crisis, 2009, it was the mortgage-backed securities that first failed in the repo market that actually caused the credit market to freeze. Because banks started saying, dude, well, it started out with saying, dude, I don't like this mortgage backed security you're giving me from Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac. I'm not gonna accept that. You have to give me a US Treasury bond. And then this bank, like a countrywide, like a Bear Stearns, says, oh, I was kind of planning on giving you that security as my collateral. I wasn't planning to have to give you something else, right? And they'll dig something else up. But eventually, the counterparty, and this is where it becomes a little technical here, but the counterparty can then say, not only the interest rate they want, but they can say, this is the kind of security I want. And ultimately, they can say, as they did with Bear Stearns and eventually with Lehman Brothers, I don't want to do business with you anymore. All right, even if you have the collateral to give me, I don't trust you anymore, or I don't want to do business with you anymore. Bear Stearns is large. So what happens in this repo market is you get a favorite person that you like to buy and sell from. For Bear Stearns, it was Goldman Sachs. And Goldman Sachs back in March of 2007 just said, you know, we don't like, we don't trust what you're giving us anymore. Um, we're going to stop lending to you. And they stopped lending on a Monday by Thursday, Bear Stearns uh, failed. That's how fast this kind of market can change it. In fact, I wrote down this number here um, <coughs> because I thought this was that important. So that, that one was an equity reserve lender to share with them for that year. In that example, Goldman Sachs was the one that had cash. Yep. So in this case, and an investment bank can be like a depository bank. I mean, it doesn't matter. In that case, Goldman Sachs just happened to have the excess money to lend out to someone else overnight. Bear Stearns needed the money and couldn't get it from Goldman Sachs. And the problem is that now there's, this is like a codependent relationship, right? Why does the woman not drop the guy who beats her, right? Well, maybe because they live in the same house, right? And then she's like, oh, fuck, I can't leave the house, right? I mean, it's that kind of codependency on an extreme scale that finally Goldman Sachs, you know, kicks the person out and, right, bad things happen, right? But it's, and the reason why I use that example is because it's a incredibly um, unhealthy codependency, but you almost need to do it because these relationships, you're asking for two or $3 million for 12 hours, right? You get favorite partners that you like to trade with. <laughs> To close it, <laughs> to close, well, yeah, to settle a trade that they've made earlier. Yep. And they'll pay interest, just like you would for any loan. Yep. But, right, and at that point, just paying interest is not enough. You have to have collateral. So you give them, so the treasury bill stays there. But the reason why it's called repo is because in that loan that's made between those two parties, you're for 12 hours 
transferring ownership of that U.S. Treasury security to the other party because they're holding it as collateral. And you have a right to repurchase that security the 12 hours later when you pay back the $2 million. So that's why it's called repo because you're giving them the security for 12 hours and then you're repurchasing the security back. Got it. So, so you give them the equivalent amount. So you're giving them $2 million in treasury bills so like or mortgage tax, bonds or whatever. Mortgage tax free. So, yep. So Goldman Sachs say, okay, you maybe pump, you let me pump like 3 million and then the bank that has access to their saying, cool, we'll do that. Mm -hmm. I get the whole $3 million worth of two bills and more back to the bar. Mm -hmm. They're 12 hours. Yeah, after the 12 hours is done, they make their money, get the paid. They get back the money, right? Yes. The interest and then they get all their bond. Right. Uh, and the interest is the 2%, right? But when it's 10%, I mean, the problem with this market is you don't really have a choice. You don't go into repo market because you're putting on an addition to your house. You're going to the repo market because you don't have a roof over your house, right? You're going to the repo market because water squirting everywhere, right? I mean, you're going to the repo market <laughs> because you have to have cash to do business the next day. And if you don't settle your trades, settling the trade, right? So you make the trade. The idea is that you generally are going to have two business days, three business days to settle the trade. Settling the trade means that the security is given to you and that the cash is transferred. Right. And then the, when you borrow, it's only half the total. Yes. Yeah. Got it. So that's why the trade is between some of the liquidized and no place to get the cash to get your stuff. You're tr well, it's liquidity because you've got two parties one party that's got too much cash and one that doesn't have enough cash liquidity but exactly right so it means that i'm taking my treasury security which is pretty liquid but not totally liquid and you're turning it into totally liquid cash overnight so that very small degree of illiquidity for the treasury bill is resolved in the repo market Unfortunately, unfortunately, you don't really have a choice. Though 10% rates were paid on Tuesday and Wednesday. Because what are you going to do? I mean, you're not going to have a roof on your house. I mean, what are you going to do? You pay the 10% and you tell everyone you know the market's failing. That's all you can do. I mean, I, there's, I mean, what do people that have bad credit do, right? They still use a credit card to buy their groceries because. 20% interest sucks, but what am I going to do? Not eat? I mean, um, okay. Um, what do I want to see here? So, the, so far, the best scenario, he said, right? Oh, well, why is the jump to 6%? Because they have too little cash to buy the excess trade. So, they're like, okay, so we don't have too much, but we really need it for the cost of the extra. You know, we don't have a lot of extra. That's so it could be that banks don't have enough excess reserves. Two is what? Two is everyone made all these payments to the U.S. government, and that took a whole bunch of cash out of the system, out of the reserves. Um, right? So it could be that banks were lending it out, but it also could be that the reserves are gone because people paid their, these big bills. Exactly. And this is the critique made against John Williams. Like every every September on this second, third week of September, it happens every year. I remember it happening in 99, 2000 when I was at the Fed. So it happens every September. It just, it happens. And we actually knew it was going to happen in the beginning of September. And so what happens is that what hap what some people are saying is that there were two people that actually run this market, right? Because John Williams is not the one, you know, behind the curtain doing this. All so He's got two people who work for him that are doing this. And they both quit about a month ago or two months ago, and they haven't been replaced. So the idea is that you've now got this kind of like hole within your personnel that maybe didn't tell John Williams fast enough. And John Williams is kind of slow with doing this. 
Well, it's not that he doesn't know what he's doing. I mean, but I mean, what it would be is that maybe it's, maybe, how do I want to say this? Maybe there should have been someone who used to work at a, um, an investment bank. So his predecessors, when we think about the predecessors, um, that would be someone like um, Tim Geithner, right? So Tim Geithner was a person who worked at Goldman Sachs and he was the person at the New York Fed um, during the crisis, right? So because he knew the markets so well, he knew exactly what the markets needed and he could communicate that to Ben Bernanke, um, who was chair, and to Hank Paulson, who ran the treasury. It's a little bit harder to do that um, okay, let's see here. Um, okay, I'm not gonna look for that far back. Um, is there an easy way to find what I'm looking for? Man, this is gonna be really long. I'm not going to go through all these. Okay, let me find, this is pretty important here. Um, I'm going somewhere with this, don't worry. Um, while I'm getting this, um, in 2018, just to give you some perspective here, in 2018, Goldman Sachs, the numbers I could find here was that Goldman Sachs got 21% of its funding from the repo market um, in 2018. So about one in $5. In 2014, it was 33%. So there's also this weird thing going on in the repo markets right now where investment banks are scared off from their 2008 dependence and they're scaling back slowly but surely their dependence on this market. Um, in 2007, Goldman Sachs was re requiring 100, so 2007, that would be crisis-ish time, $160 billion from the repo market every night, $160 billion a night. In June 30th, 2019, that's the latest data I could find. In, so 2007, 160 billion, June 30th, 2019, 70 billion. So, so, the demand conditions are also changing as well. Um, let's see here. I don't want that. I want the, I think it's this one. And it's this video right here, I think, as soon as it comes up. Oh yeah, how do I, I gotta share the audio. Maybe I can, yeah. Uh, I guess I could do it this way too. Oh yeah, good call. Maybe. No, oh, we're not gonna all hear this. Okay, I'm so Take a second. I'm learning. Okay, how do I? It's going to be a bad lecture. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
Well, the speaker is very far away from me. Are you required? No. Which one? Hello. Wait, this is. How about now? So, oh. You think it's the iPad? How about now? Is it better? This is going to be me. Yeah. Well, this is perfect. Um, okay, here, I'm just going to do this. Okay. I'm going to leave the meeting. I'm going to leave the meeting and I'm going to fix it this way. What I'm going to show you is important. It's worth our time. I'm not trying to waste your time with this. Um, I give up. Chris and I give it up. And give it up. You think so? I'll figure it out. You tell me what to do. Wow, this country western thing is going to be very important. Um, some of you have seen this before. Um, well, somehow I found it here. This one's working. This one's going to go. One guy forgot about that. The Japanese melting. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So today is ending up being a lot more about the repo market than I intended. Um, but I just think it's a shame if you were to go into this world, as some of you seem to be, and not know about the repo market. Let's see here. Um, that's Bernanke. If the bond, let's see here. I think it's right here, right here. Bear Stearns' fate would be in Tim Geithner's hands. Let's actually go back here. I just want to show about. This will be about five or ten minutes. Oh. Jeez, this can't get a break. On Thursday, bear stock continued to fall, and the reserve was almost completely gone. By six o'clock, it's very clear that they do not have enough money to open the next day. They have 12 to 14 hours to do something unprecedented in terms of raising emergency capital. Okay, so right there. Uh, I'm going to rewind it a little bit further because I need to, but you're getting that indication right there. They've run out of cash. They've lost access to the repo market. 
And this guy is basically saying, now that they don't have any cash, now they have to get an emergency set of money. I'm going to go back a little further here then. Here we go. Okay, this will be good. This is where I want to be, I think. So if we think about this, the reason why, you know, when we think of the 2008 crisis, we always think of Lehman Brothers, but it's actually Bear Stearns that really represents the first domino in this. And then it built up from March to September and culminated in September when Lehman Brothers failed. <laughs> As the smallest investment bank on Wall Street, Bear Stearns looks vulnerable. Wednesday, two days into the crisis. So again, Bear Stearns, just so you know, is an investment bank, not a depository institution. That means that it's owned by shareholders. Um, you know, buys bonds, buys stocks sells bonds, sells stocks, and might be short on cash, but got collateral, meaning that to settle certain trades, they're gonna to have to go in the repo market to settle trades. They needed to do <coughs> temporarily. To store the best you can do is bring out the CEO and say, well, this is serious. By Wednesday morning, that's where bearings come to. I called over there at the PR, Talk to them about it. Stock is keeps getting hammered. Talk to a lot of people. I think they would want to hear from him. Alan Schwartz, their CEO, decided to give Faber the interview. Joining me now, first on CNBC, is Alan Schwartz. He is personally president and CEO. Mr. Schwartz, thanks so much uh, for being here this morning. And a good thing with the on the trading floor is we listen to the interview. Everyone's very focused on on listening because this we knew this would be the uh, the nexus point for how the rest of the week would play out. When I'm told by a hedge fund that I know well that last night they tried to close out a mortgage uh, a credit protection. Faber's uh, first question was a tough one. He raised the specter. And we wind that again. Listen very carefully to what David Faber is saying in the background. Not too much from bigger voice. Listen because this we knew this would be the uh, the nexus point for how the rest of the week would play out. When I'm told by a hedge fund that I know well that last night they tried to close out a mortgage uh, a credit protection. Faber's first question was a tough one. He raised the specter that one of Bear's most important trading partners, Goldman Sachs, might be deserting them. Say you're not aware that that would be the case. Uh, I'm not aware of you know, on a specific trade from one counterpart to another. You're just moving out and Oh man, that was a shitty response. Um, I'm going to rewind that again just so you hear how shitty that response was. Say you're not aware of that. Uh, I'm not aware of that, you know, on a specific trade from one counterpart to another. And you're just moving out and connected. You. That doesn't sound all that bad. In fact, that is it's the other side of this market. So basically, David Faber's question was a hedge fund who's obviously participating in this repo market as well, because they would hold a lot of U.S. treasuries and mortgage-backed securities, that a hedge fund told David Faber, the, the news guy, and he said, last night when I was in the market poking around, I saw that Bear Stearns and Goldman Sachs, um, we're going to do this deal in the repo market, and that Goldman Sachs, th the counterparty, decided not to accept Bear Stearns' uh, mortgage-backed credit swaps. Don't worry about that. I mean, don't worry about the technical type of collateral. Goldman Sachs was supposed to give cash to Bear Stearns in exchange for Bear Stearns' collateral of a credit swap on a mortgage-backed security. And Goldman Sachs would not accept Bear Stearns's um, collateral, which isn't too surprising because think back to that time. This is when mortgage-backed securities <laughs> were getting kind of shitty. But his shitty response makes it sound not like the collateral was bad, 
but that the bank was bad, right? If he had given a better response, he could have said bad things going on in the mortgage, you know, mortgage bond market. That would have been far different than him just saying, well, if I know what happened, right? I mean, which is kind of what he's kind of saying here is, I don't know what happened with one party and another. Because then everyone's going to say like, well, geez, is this guy really running it or what's going on? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going to rewind that back. <laughs> was what? <laughs> yeah, yes. Yes. So the counterparty here would be uh, Goldman Sachs, correct? There's most important trading partners. Goldman Sachs might be deserting them. Say you're not aware of it. That uh, I'm not aware, uh, you know, on a specific trade, but one kind of part. You're just moving out and connected. That doesn't sound all that bad. In fact, that is the kiss of death. He has all but driven the spear from Schwartz's heart because he's saying that Bear Stearns is not trustworthy in the eyes of those it trades with. For Bear, it turns out to be a big blow because it's a public acknowledgement of what sounds like a specific example in Allen looks to some people like he's not on the ball. So Alan's the guy who's running Bear Stearns. Um, and basically, David Faber, the news guy, is basically saying to Alan, dude, I heard this rumor. You went in the repo market, couldn't get the cash you needed from Goldman Sachs. Obviously, they still got it somehow because Bear Stearns was alive that day. But basically, David's like, dude, I think that Goldman doesn't like you anymore. And Alan comes out and is like, oh, so I don't know what's going on. Right, and then everyone's then like, I don't trust Alan anymore. I don't trust Bear Stearns anymore. Not thinking about the fact that it's this, because remember, this is representing the first time that mortgage-backed credit swaps or credit securities are starting to get, are don't have the amount of trust that they used to have. So this is a pivotal moment because it's only by in the later months where then you would say, oh, mortgage-backed securities are just the shitty thing, not the investment thing. But this is a moment where the CEO didn't perform as he needed to perform and people just stopped trusting that investment bank instead. Go on, yeah. He messed up the response. Yeah, I mean, it was also something bad that happened, but also he didn't help it. It's kind of like when you're skidding on ice and you're supposed to steer into the skid seems counterintuitive, but in this case, you should have just said, yeah, the, the collateral is actually pretty bad that we were giving them. And that would have actually been a far better response than just saying, I don't know. Well, this is also the problem too. Of CEOs usually don't get, unless you're a tech firm, CEOs don't get to where they are by being extroverts extraordinaire, um, right? They're not like PR polished people. They're usually good at numbers. They're usually good. They're usually good lawyers. They're usually, I mean, they're extroverted enough that they got the board of directors to like them because that's how they got to become CEO. But unless you're like a tech firm and you're like Zuckerberg or something, you're not going to like be wooing over the yeah. Or like Steve Jobs. Okay, Steve Jobs, Steve Jobs, the, the former Steve Jobs. Thank you so much for uh, being here this morning. Appreciate it. This is important. To survive, it would have to find more lenders willing to loan it money. Okay, so now things are getting bad, right? Because Goldman is now pulling back. Others are now pulling back after that interview. But they've still got huge capital requirements that they can only satisfy by continuing to go to the repo market. The repo market, right? So every night, every few nights, repo market. What this amounts to effectively is that investment banks can devote their confidence every night on whether they survive or not. And that night, the markets were voting no confidence in Bear Stearns. The stock was dropping, and the cash reserves were beginning to dwindle. This stuff became a self-fulfilling prophecy. You know, a lot of people that perhaps do not have access. 
and listening to some of the things that were going on. So now I can't leave my assets there anymore. I have to take them out. You're sitting in the middle of an avalanche. What can you do if you're on the side of a mountain and an avalanche comes at you? An avalanche was what, 60 miles an hour? You can't outrun, right? <laughs> what can you do? The story has continued to mushroom. Uh, on Thursday, bear stock continued to fall, and the reserve was almost completely gone. By six o'clock, it was very clear that they do not have enough money to open the next day. They have 12 to 14 hours to do something unprecedented in terms of raising emergency capital or going. They have one last chance. So this is a little bit different. So if they were a depository bank, uh, meaning they accepted deposits, made loans based on those deposits, they would be guaranteed access to the Federal Reserve, right? It's lender of last resort. That's one of the critical roles that the Federal Reserve plays. That same responsibility does not hold true for investment banks, as we saw with Lehman Brothers, right? Lehman Brothers is the example of the investment bank that the Federal Reserve did not bail out. As we're going to see here, um, the decision that they have to make in March is, are we going to bail out March before that September, right? So this is like the however many months that is, six months before that. They have to decide for the first time, are we going to bail out Bear, Bear Stearns or not? Well, Reserve Bank in New York. Tim Geithner was in charge. There's Tim. There's Timmy. He's doing his summer's years at Treasury. He's 47 years old. He looks like he's about 32. Universally liked and respected. Extremely nice smart, extremely aware of the stuff. Very discreet, controlled. And he sort of serves as an intermediary between Washington and Wall Street because he sits in Manhattan, but he works for the Federal Reserve System. That night, Bear Stearns paid would be in Tim Geithner's hands. <coughs> Geithner's people went to Bear's headquarters and they started to go through all the accounts. <coughs> Geithner told me he initially thought that they uh, should let Bear go on death. By midnight, by one, two in the morning, everybody and their mother has to be there. Uh, Morgan, Fed, the SEC, and they find out there is stuff to the gills with toxic waste. They found billions in hidden subprime mortgage loans. And something worse, credit default swaps, a form of insurance. Bear had promised if bonds had insured failed, they would pay. They were really very mysterious instruments that only the sort of financial wizard understood. Credit default swap is basically just an agreement that I have with you where I sell you insurance on some bond loan. If the bond goes belly up, I promise to pay you. And as long as the bond doesn't go belly up, you pay me for, the, for selling the insurance. Geithner's investigators told him that Bayer had made credit default swap deals worth hundreds of billions of dollars all over Wall Street and around the world. Through the night, things changed as the people in the Fed discovered the position that Bear was in and discovered what had happened. They did go under. Because Bear Stearns was so indebted to so many other people, their failure to repay their debt or pay their debt would cause a cascade of other failures. Every single part of Wall Street at this point is plugged into another part of Wall Street. And if I go down, I can now drag down that guy, and if he goes down, he can drag down that guy, and he can drag down that guy, and this is a huge web that connects everyone in these completely unforeseen ways. They then reported back to Geithner that Morgan had used to more complicated than the paper. Geithner saw what central bankers fear most, systemic risk. Bear was constantly interconnected with other banks up and down Wall Street. Geithner picked up a phone at four in the morning and called his boss at the Federal Reserve, Ted Burnett. 
Ben Bernanke is a highly, highly respected scholar, and not only a scholar of, of economics, but of the Great Depression. If he weren't chairman of the Fed, he'd be top of the list of people you'd be going to for advice and understanding about this stuff. <clears throat> On this night, one of the Depression experts' darkest fears was being realized. Ben Bernanke felt that the risk to the system, the financial system as a whole, would be too great if Bear Stearns were allowed to go bankrupt. It was clear that this had to be contained. There was no doubt in his mind. He, more than anyone else, appreciated what would happen if he got out of control. He was absolutely determined to be an activist Fed governor. That when the crisis came along, his Fed would throw every weapon it had at the problem. But the Federal Reserve was prohibited from directly lending cash to bear an unregulated investment tax. Bernanke was prepared to get around the rules, and he did. Very early in the morning, the Federal Reserve has a conference call. Ben Bernanke's on it, Tim Geithner's on it, among others. They eventually came up with this idea of giving a loan to J.P. Morgan, which was Bear's clearing bank, and having J.P. Morgan pass on the cash to Bear. So indirectly lending to them via J.P. Morgan. We have important news to share with you about Bear Stearns, a company that I've been reporting on all week. We interviewed the study 30 that they announced that you Let me share with you this press release that has just hit. The Federal Reserve Bank and J.P. Morgan Chase announced that they have agreed to provide secured funding to Bear Stearns as necessary. Make no mistake, the Federal Reserve is bailing out Bear Stearns, and they're using J.P. Morgan as a conduit. But Bernanke's unprecedented plan almost immediately backfired. Because Bayer Stearns was the only one to get that treatment. Obviously, the Fed was sending a message. This is an institution that's about to fail. So to single them out, in a sense. Sorry, so again, and, and I know I was going to train this a little bit longer here, but it's kind of telling you the rest of the story here, is that basically Ben Bernanke uh, decides as the, um, <coughs> as the Federal Reserve that they will bail out um, Bear Stearns. But the way that they're gonna bail them out is they want them to continue to exist. They're just gonna back up all of the securities with its now largest trading partner, JP Morgan. But in the act of doing that, you are now telling the rest of the market, dude, Bear Stearns is so bad this is like having a credit card, but having one of those credit cards where you have to make a deposit at the bank just enough to, right? It's like, like called the secured credit card where you can only use it as much as you have in the bank. That's essentially what Bear Stearns has now. It has one of those like, you know, nothing wrong with it for if you're just starting out, right? But one of those credit cards where you don't have a credit limit, you can basically take out what you've got in the bank. Um, and that's what Bear Stearns has. So it's a virtually assign them to a death sentence. People are trying to trade this company as if its entire fate is totally in question at this point. At the opening at 9 30, you probably have a, basically a 50% sell off in the stock. At 10 o'clock Eastern time, at Bear Stearns hit $30, and people sort of gasped and they hit $30. Yeah. They basically, they, they, they saw the, the after they became clear with everyone else who buys this stock, like, oh crap. Yeah, no one's going to, I mean, so the Federal Reserve is going to back up now all the securities that Bear Stearns has, but now everyone else is going to be like, well, dude, if I've got other people I can lend my money to, why do I want to get in business dealing with someone that doesn't even have enough cash to not have a, a this is like the equivalent of having a co-signer on a loan, right? I mean, why wouldn't you just deal with someone that doesn't have to have a co-signer, right? Why wouldn't you just... Well, now, so now, right, the investment bank has got two sides to it, right? When they go on the repo market, they're just trying to get their daily operations financed. But as an investment bank, like Goldman Sachs, like the others, they have shareholders. And those shareholders are basically saying, if an investment bank is going to fail in the United States with this crisis that we all know is coming, why would I want to be holding this stock? of this company why wouldn't i buy someone else so now what's happening so on some level it doesn't really 
the share price going down doesn't really affect Bear Stearns directly because people already bought the stock and that provided their initial capitalization. But the traders are all compensated with shares of Bear Stearns. So now, so th now basically you're going to lose all your key employees, right? Because they're all compensated with stock and stock options that they were granted in previous years. And now these shares are worth a fraction of what they used to be worth. So now everyone's going to run for the door, right? All the Bear Stearns employees are going to be like, why would I want to stay here? I'm going to get a job somewhere else while I still can. From a different company. Yep. In Washington, well, yes. And what he ended up doing is he thought that by co-signing on the loan that Bear Stearns could build up good credit and be able to borrow again. Um, but since this is the first time doing it, basically it's like co-signing the loan of like a drug addict. Like it's going to be really hard for that person to not go back to drugs and end up failing on the loan. And not that Bear Stearns is the drug addict, but it's the most, right? If we had to think of who would you not want to co-sign a loan to, right? A not even recovering yet drug addict would probably be the kind of person you wouldn't want to co-sign their loan, right? Because, I mean, the statistics tell us there's a high rate of them returning back to drugs, right? Unless they found God, right? It's probably pretty high that they're going to go to drugs. So, um, you know, so at that point, basically Bernanke tried to find a solution that was going to avoid taking direct ownership by just co-signing the loan, but it ended up just happening, uh, right? It just became a self-fulfilling prophecy in this case. Yeah. And basically they're, they're in so much debt because they made, they sold insurance into World mortgages saying that if they defaulted on the mortgages, then they'll be prepared to pay, up, pay their mortgage. Exactly, it augments, so, and Lehman made the same bet. Um, and AIG made the same bet as well. Um, Bear Stearns is obviously going to get bought out by someone else. Lehman Brothers is going to fail completely. And after those two, then the government just finally said, fuck, we'll just bail out AIG. So it's not that Lehman was worse than AIG. It's just that AIG happened after Lehman. If Lehman had happened after AIG, Lehman probably would have been the one that was saved. Um, so those three, Bear Stearns, Lehman Brothers, AIG, all did the same thing. They basically insured mortgage-backed securities. And they basically said, if enough of the mortgages fail in this securitized bond, if enough of the mortgages fail, we will... Reimburse for the buyer's loan. Exactly. Yeah, that we will pay the principal even though the bond has failed. But no one thought that that many mortgages would fail that they would ever have to pay out. So it's like, Dude, I've lived here since 2015, and I've had hurricane insurance every year I've lived here. Dude, you know, like, in sh for those of you in risk management, that would be a good thing for me personally, right? Because you don't want to have to use insurance. But from an insurance perspective, right, especially on Oahu, we don't get too many direct hits of a hurricane. So it's kind of like, why wouldn't you write a policy for Oahu? Because what are the chances it's going to happen, right? Just like earthquake yes. insurance, right? But when it does... So the issue here was, what do you do in 2005 if you want to make money? What do you do in 2006 if you want to make money? You write credit swaps for mortgage-backed securities, meaning insurance policies for mortgage-backed securities. And you're going to collect the premiums, just like um, First Hawaiian Insurance is collecting my premiums now, right? And maybe there's not going to be a hurricane, so maybe they'll just get to keep my 75 bucks a year. but what if the hurricane comes, right? Then there just has to be enough of people like me coming in and asking for money, and right? But it happens like a lot. And you're just like really hard. And then you're like, oh man, what are we going to do? And that's when you start getting like weird. Yeah, so in some sense it was, 
no one thought that they would ever fail. So they actually just underpriced the risk. Um, I guess you could say in some sense. Um, yeah. So this isn't like a hurricane hitting Nebraska, which might even be physically impossible, right? This is like just saying, I'll charge you a dollar a year to insure against a hurricane hitting New Orleans. Right, so the person who calculated the risk, right? Yeah, and there's no history of mortgage backed securities failing, except unless you go back to 1932, 1933. So their premiums were enough to cover the chance that would happen. And then the risk managers didn't say, God, we're holding a lot, an awful lot of um, insurance policies for the exact same risk to happen, right? It's just like you don't open up an insurance company and say, I'm going to only insure people age over 60 who've had a heart attack, right? Like, because you're just asking for a problem, right? I mean, you don't like to just um, insure a single group of like-minded individuals because for anyone in the health, in the insurance industry, right? You want a normally distributed risk for so one profile. Part, one part fails, you still have the other Exactly. And so some people would say, well, even if a mortgage bond fails, maybe it'll fail in San Francisco or in Boston. It's not gonna fail in Des Moines, but it did. Right? So how do you control for that kind of thing? And then so the Fed was afraid. No, they were afraid to shut the box. Ben Bernanke? Ben Bernanke was afraid that if the go down, everyone else around them is going to go down, therefore causing a kind of a recession. Right? And then so he, um, he thought that that would work, but that didn't work. So I'm not sure he would have thought that yet. Yeah. Um, is Shannon asking if you're still on Zoom? I am, yes. Uh, tell her uh, that the code is 674-027. Nine eight seven two. Yep. Okay, let's see if I can get this to work. Oh, it's like frozen. Watch the rest of this though, because unfortunately the computer is not working. Um, okay, let me see if I can make it happier. Let me plug in my seat to it. Maybe it's just really unhappy. Okay, let me go back to this. Um, let me. Oh, but then I can't. Oh, are you kidding me? Okay. Uh, what time is it? 6.30. Okay, let's take a break now for uh, five to ten minutes while I fix the computer, and then we'll resume. Resume. <laughs> okay. Man, this computer is like an ancient piece of junk. Hmm? Yeah, I don't know how to do that. Are you a tech expert? Not but do you feel confident? Well, that's pretty good. Uh, <laughs> so you can start this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, you can share your computer. Yeah, I just said, fuck it. Let me start the whole thing. No. Um, and in fact, it'll just get uh, hotter um, because they'll turn off the air here very shortly. Uh, okay. Okay. Um, I actually got back to the movie. Um, I just want to show the last, I know I'm showing it more than I intended, but I actually think it's reinforcing. Um, these markets that you typically are not dealing with, and I know I'm deviating a little bit from the title of this course, Analyzing Financial and Economic Data. I just, it would really hurt my stomach if, um, I thought that you were going to graduate as some of you are this semester or next semester, and you didn't even know what the repo market was. Um, but some of you should complain to. Um, well, yeah, I suppose. But I shouldn't have to do all the work. 
Keep and Save Bear was not Henry Paulson's idea or style. It was a bet he's called. But from now on, though, Paulson would get involved. He and Ben Bernanke would face the crisis together. It helps me to think about this crisis as a, as a patient that's gone through spasms. And each time, uh, the spasms seem to be getting worse. And it helps me to think about Bernanke and Paulson as the two doctors in the room trying to and that's actually, so that goes back to um, what you said, Levi, and even what you said, Cody, of, um, you know, if Bear Stearns is understood to be the patient, this was Bernanke's first attempt at reviving the patient. And it turned out that, yeah, was it going to be enough? Settle the patient down. Saturday morning, Bernanke and Paulson were lawyers and accountants from Bear's competitors descended to examine the book. He was like, he was kicked over in, in the cemetery uh, by the dead or dying. Uh, there were people kicking over the cars. It was the ugliest thing I've ever seen. In the end, no one wanted to take on Bear Stern's death. But on Sunday morning, Bernanke pushed back, creating a shotgun marriage between Bear and J.P. Morgan. Paulson went along as Bernanke guaranteed the deal with a $30 million dollar to cover Bear's toxic assets. Yeah. Was it J.P. Morgan that said there was an underwriter's bank for Bear already? Exactly. Yep. So the reason, yep. So the reason why, um, after Goldman Sachs did not want to deal anymore with Bear Stearns, J.P. Morgan if Bear Stearns didn't get dealt with, J.P. Morgan was going to get dragged down too. So a domino kind of like effect, which is why the Federal Reserve, if it wants to even somewhat try to save Bear Stearns, it, has, it can't do it directly because, again, Federal Reserve can't be helping investment banks in that kind of way. Um, but what it can do is it can provide a credit facility that J.P. Morgan can use to help Bear Stearns. Yeah. Lending of thirty billion dollars against those securities uh, made it palatable for JP Morgan to go ahead. Without that, there wouldn't have been a deal. But Paulson still had misgivings. He immediately issued a warning to Wall Street. This was not going to happen again. Oh, oh, it's not going to happen again. So this is so now. Think about this. Um, at this point, then, um, if you are working at Lehman Brothers, you had from this point forward to raise your cash. Lehman should have started raising cash at this moment in March of, um, of 2007, 2008. We're not going to be able to anyone again. Yep, we're doing it this one time. No one else knew the problem. We're, you know, so it's like with a child, right? They do something wrong. You don't just start wailing on them, right? You tell them what you did is wrong. You explain why it was wrong. And then you issue the threat. If I have to tell you this again, you know, end of the world's coming. You're not. You're not. I'm not going to help you. Tough you love. Everyone else was in in the chairs and just like start to sweat. Should be starting to sweat, but the critique you could make against Lehman Brothers is that they didn't listen, or chose not to listen, or some would say were so confident that they were different than Bear Stearns and they were better than Bear Stearns. It was made after it was formed. Lehman Brothers was formed after the Civil War, right? So Abe Lincoln was the president, right? So like, why wouldn't you, if you're Lehman Brothers, say, "I'm not Bear Stearns. I'm better than Bear Stearns." My my bonds that I have are better than what Bear Stearns had. So we're not the same, we'll be okay. He said, so the catechism was a free market, moral hazard. I was aware of anyone that is a moral hazard. I'm also aware of moral hazard poses the question if you bail somebody out of a problem they themselves caused, what incentive will they have the next time? To avoid making the same mistake. As a hard bitten veteran of Wall Street, 
Person had personally made hundreds of millions of dollars believing that that government was no government. He's an unapologetic free marketeer. He's a Republican. He has that deregulatory mindset that the Bush administration has. That's why he was chosen. And that same Sunday afternoon, as the very last details of the deal were being ironed out, Paulson decided to starkly make the moral hazard point. He picked up the phone and called J.P. Morgan's CEO. Paulson wanted to send a message that this is not going to be a bailout that you're going to like if you're Bear Stearns. You know, you did dumb things, and you're going to be punished. So, uh, um, the question then is, if you're going to, right, so, this, so what's being said here is then, if, and the reason why I'm still showing you this here, right, is that this all started with the repo market. It's where all of this bad stuff now happening all started with that first bad thing, which was Bear Stearns lost access to the repo market by the CEO making one comment of, I don't know what one party said to the other, right? And then everyone in the repo market, which they critically depended on, just like every other investment bank right now, critically, well, less so, but still relies on, right? Then all saying, we don't trust Bear Stearns anymore. And um, Federal Reserve is going to bail them out. But they're concerned that if they just bail out this one bank, they're going to have to bail out every bank. So now Hank Paulson, Treasury Secretary, has to now, it's not just enough just to say, don't do it again. You have to issue some really big threat, right? So like if this is your child and you believe in spanking, you got to start showing the belt, right? Or you got to start like doing a fake drop kick or something. Right? You got to be showing that the way you're talking is the way it's going to be, right? I don't believe it's going to be. by its own employees. At the end of the week, <laughs> that stock was selling for $30 a share. J.P. Morgan was offering $4. Four bucks. Four bucks. No. I want you to do it for $2 a share. We don't want anyone in America, particularly... So there you go. So J.P. Morgan was going to pay $4 a share for this $30 a share company. Already a pretty big haircut, but and Paulson, phone toting guy here, is going to say, no, I want it to be so bad that everyone gets scared shitless, right? So this isn't, this isn't just like saying, I'm going to spank you, kid. This is saying, I'm going to open the door, make you stand outside for the night, and I'm going to close the door, kind of you know, like really scar you um, in your childhood. To think that the government has a safety net for you whenever you need it. I want it to be so, so painful for any Bear Stearns shareholder that it's almost as if they went out of business. At six o'clock, the Bear employees received the word about a price talk that you were hearing was you know, in the $20 range, $20. $15. So when they announced that we were going to sell it to JP Morgan for the price of two dollars per share, uh, it was it was a shock. And people are actually crying. People thought it was a misprint. They thought it was a couple of zeros. Hank Greenberg. This has to be about if you've ever if you've never seen a grown man cry you're about getting as close as you can see to grown men crying because most of these men they're showing here lost uh tens of millions of dollars so i don't know you're that kind of person who likes schadenfreude and other people's misfortunes you're getting pretty close to seeing people cry here they went to auction for all this weight and their stock was reduced to two dollars yeah and it was thirty dollars that friday when the market closed on Friday. So like, they probably have it? like hundreds. Uh, ten millions of dollars, yeah. Millions of dollars. I don't think that's not fair to some of the risks, but you know, like selling the company in a way. No, it does. I mean, what you're trying to do here at this point is this is like a patient that's got a very bad infection and they're about to die. 
And the question is, do I let the patient continue to live, but be infectious for everyone else? Or do I just let that really infectious patient just die and I just bury him under the ground? Right? So if we let Bear Stearns continue to survive, it's going to infect the rest of the investment banks. So you almost want it to die. So what do you do? What they're doing is they're giving them money to pay off everyone so no one will go down with them and then kill them. Yeah, well, it's going to be owned by J.P. Morgan. So J.P. Morgan <coughs> owning Bear Stearns now for $2 a share. Right. Yeah. Because you can't just... They're not going to declare bankruptcy because if they declare bankruptcy, everyone exits the repo market just like they did at Lehman in September of this year, same year. So they were trying to avoid that by saying $2 a share. And... Yeah. It had taken seven days. Bear Stearns was gone. Think about that. That first thing with Alan talking on CNBC, that was one week prior to this all happening. So one week of lost access to the repo market brought down Bear Stearns. Yeah. Bear Stearns had not been alone standing on houses. Until the market collapsed, the entire country had been encouraged to do the same thing. You can see that people were taking mortgages that they obviously couldn't afford. Go to a cocktail party or you go to a barbecue, and two or three of the people that were there were telling you how wealthy they were because the value of their home had gone so high. Nobody cared if they could afford the payments. Because the act of buying the house itself meant that you were going to get rich. The guy looked at it and said, what problem was, and it didn't turn out. Okay. So um, at some point, maybe we'll end up watching the rest of this. But um, at this point, right, that should give you some idea of why the repo market was actually the cause of, or was the reason why the last recession was a financial crisis was because it was the collapse of the repo market that made that recession a financial crisis. The recession we had in 2001, we don't call that a financial crisis because the repo market did what it was supposed to do. The concern would be is that the next recession that we have, is it going to be the case that the repo market is going to behave the way that it should? So far, we're not given any evidence that it's going to perform the way that it should. I mean, I'm not trying to be a, a pessimist here, but um, what happened isn't very reassuring. Um, but then again, it happens every single year. I mean, it does, but every June it's my birthday. I mean, right? And I know it's my birthday. Um, and you would think then I plan it, right? Like I think about what I'm going to eat that day, right? And <laughs> yeah, but I mean, like when I, you know, when the rest of the family is going to take me out to eat or <laughs> things like that. Um... <laughs> okay, so um, now I want to get to. What I originally was going to do before um, I got on this whole repo, but I, I start with this thing about what I started off with again at five o'clock, right? Um, was showing a chart that you probably didn't think that much about, um, and you didn't even know what the chart was, quite honestly. So. Um, Um, it would have been about as high. Um, yeah. Uh, if the market wasn't failing itself. Um, yes. During the crisis, you're saying, right? Yeah. That it was just as bad. Um, I was trying to look at that too while we were um, watching that part of the video that um, – 
that. Um, oh, what happened there was that's when the $128 billion all flooded into the market at once. So then the market's like, fuck, we were charging 10%. Now there's this $128 billion there that wasn't there before. Let's just get it out there and get it lent out. And then the market stabilizes within half a day. I, I want you to notice though here too, what happened here, the reason why this is such a peak here is that the market basically ran out of cash at about 2.55 p.m. Eastern time and the market closes at 3 p.m. Eastern time. So this is like, People coming to the bank at, uh, let's say the bank closed at 4.30, coming to the bank at 4.15 and a whole bunch of people coming to the bank at 4.15 and saying, I would like to make a, I would like to apply for a loan, right? Which is basically what this market again represents. Not that they're taking out their cash, that they're applying for a loan, right? And so you triage things. And so the market, like 2.55 p.m., basically all of the market players are closing up shop, right? I mean, it's the end of the day, you're turning off your computer, that kind of thing. So this is all happening. Um, and I was, just think about that. This is about 7 a.m., 8 a.m. here. And so I, I usually, when I wake up, I turn on CNBC. It's the first thing I turn on. Um, and, you know, if you're watching it, it every the market participants were quite surprised that the market was doing what it was doing very, so very close to the market, that repo market closing at that point. So it was pandemonium in the repo market and pandemonium in the repo market means loss of liquidity. And the only thing that can happen then is that you um, respond to it by um, um, telling John Williams, we need the money and John saying, oh, Dude, the two guys that usually tell me to give you the money aren't, don't work for us anymore. Oh, okay, I'll give you the money uh, when I get into work tomorrow. Right, because the market's already closed by the time he finds out. So the best he can do is tell the market, don't worry, first thing in the office, when I get in the office tomorrow, I'll fix it. So that's, flat line. That's, that, that's that flat line for that little bit. And then the, the so peak down. All the money comes in and the market goes down. Okay. $128 billion. $128 billion. Um, yeah, so it's a lot of money. Um, so, yeah, yep. Yeah. As simple as that. Um, it's $128 billion just coming in, and then all of a sudden, um, the concern is that the problem actually isn't fixed. So I got this chart last night, um, but we said on Wednesday, the Federal Reserve actually changed the interest rate. So this is actually about the same amount, more or less than it was before, but now the interest rate is lower. So it's still higher than it should be. And again, we're at the peak point. So the market is still kind of fucked up. Um, and I'm not, we're not entirely sure. I mean, I'd like to tell you more definitive answers about where things are at this point, but honestly, we don't really know. The big question that I have and other economists would have at this point is, did it shoot up John Williams and other Federal Reserve officials? If you ask them today what happened, on Wednesday or on Tuesday or on Monday, they would tell you it's that shitty weekend Wednesday where all these things came due that everyone needed cash and banks just don't have the kind of reserves like they used to because of QE ending. And so it was just like a bad confluence of events. That's what they would tell you. Others would tell you maybe this next recession is going to be more like 2008 than 2001, where the market, the repo market's actually gonna fail again. That's the bad scenario. Yeah, the worst case scenario is the repo market fails and liquidity is lost, making it a 2008 rather than a 2001 crisis. That's what you mean by different uh, best scenario? Best case scenario, bad things all happened at the same time. 
and it went up to 10%, you found out what the problem was, you fixed it. Well, yeah, I mean, you could. I mean, but. So the question, right? So I mean, we're all, we still have some excess reserves. So part of the problem, maybe you would say to yourself, maybe the problem is, maybe the problem isn't that the banks didn't have enough reserves. <clears throat> banks, though, but you had a situation where on Monday and Tuesday, banks either chose not to lend out their excess reserves or individual banks that typically traded with the other banks didn't have the excess reserves, but the Fed wasn't on top of it. And then maybe if those two employees were working that day, maybe they would have then been able to say, oh, dude, first financial uh, wherever of Spokane typically buys the bonds from this guy, but they don't have any reserves. We as the Fed should step in and and what happens is that it cascades. So it's not like it was a $128 billion shortfall that all happened at once. It was people with their fingers saying, looking at their screen and saying, whoa, look at the repo market. 4%, 5%, 6%, a market that's typically 2.25%. And they're like, oh, fuck. Now, you know, second financial wants some money from me? Oh, I'm only going to give it to you if I can get 8%, right? Because they're also trying to make money too, right? No one's doing this out of generosity, right? So second financial also wants to get as high of an interest rate as possible. In a market that's running properly at 2.25, they can't get any higher than 2.25. But in a market where you see, you see it keep ratcheting up, you'd be like, dude, you need the money? Market's looking pretty shitty right now. I've got money, 8%, right? And you're like, okay, I guess I'll pay it, right? And then the next person's going to pay 8.5%, 9%. And you get all the way up to 10% and it hits three o'clock. Right? Market closed. So then you have to call up John Williams, say, dude, the market's failing. We need the money. And they got to do what they got to do. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, yeah, and it's not like we feel bad for them because, I mean, it's a bank. So it's not like. You know, I'm not going to cry any tears. Um, but at the same time, um, how do I get my... Yeah, but I mean, yeah, at the end of the day, I mean, I'm not going to cry tonight thinking about a bank that lost money. Um, it's, I think the bigger concern is going to be, does it happen again? Um, because if it happens again, you're not going to be able to use your excuse that it was this bad confluence of events. Because again, if you go, <laughs> um, back to here, I mean, we do see that something bad happened here. But again, look at the predictability, right? Every September, right? I mean, if you if we space that data out better, you would see every September there's a little peak. But somehow, now right here, this would be another quarterly tax payment due, December 30th or December 31st. But so that's already a sign, dude. Either those two people were that essential, or right. So we had nine months to prepare for something that we didn't do our job for. Um, that, that scary thing to figure it was way bigger than normal. Yeah. And yeah, I got as high as ten percent, and it's basically <coughs> right at three p.m. Um, right, if we could do this by Bloomberg, I could have actually altered this a little bit more, but I would have looked um, probably in 10 minute increments, and we would have seen that ratcheting up in the last hour, certainly, but in those last few minutes where... Can we make a graph like this on Fred? No, not on Fred, no. Um, 
we're going to be able to do it once we get to next month and I have you all do uh, paper money, which is that other kind of financial trading platform. Um, we will be able to get the data from there. Yeah. Um, we can make this chart I got from Fred, uh, this chart I got from Fred, and um, this chart I got from Fred. But you can't get that cool data like that. Isn't that the first thing that you showed us that we got from Fred? This one? Oh, yeah. Or this one? Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's the same thing, but just like the less accurate one. Yeah, it's less accurate, and it's not. Um, you can't break it down any with any greater detail than this. Can, we, can you make it go back further, though? Yeah, yeah, you could. Um, I just didn't. Yeah, I mean, it's not that interesting. Um, except that quarterly tax time. Tax time. Did you see that kind of big spike back when we had the Great Recession? Yeah. So let's try to see. Okay, so let's not, I'm not going to recreate it, but let's, um, well, let's see. No, let's see here. So, because I was looking, I was trying to look at this during the break, or during the, Well, but this is cool. Let me just show you this one. I'm just looking at this just to go back to um, what I was saying before about it being at the upper range. Um, again, it's not going to let me draw on this. So, no. Um, so, when we talk about the Federal Reserve changing the interest rate, all they're doing is changing the target. But like a target, right, like the bullseye on a, on a dartboard, it's a circle, right, that has a range, a small range of error, but a range of error around it, right? But it doesn't matter. You can still get it in that little circle, and it counts as a bullseye. Whether it's in the middle of that circle or on the edge of that little circle of the bullseye, it's still a bullseye, right? That's what we're talking about here. The bullseye here, that circle is the blue and the red. Right, anything in between the blue and the red, you're all good. And the troubling thing here is that we're only talking about going to buy off about one, about 18 months, is that we've been pretty good about kind of staying in the middle ish area. Except now, look at what's now happened. We're now at the red, and we are still at the red right now. Meaning, so. The, the target rate is the upper bound. That's our now what the, the rate is that the Federal Reserve announced that it's raising. Um, the lower bound is our overnight reverse repo rate. Um, again, that would be the rate that the market's determining in this uh, market where you have securitized markets. Um, and we're obviously, and then, um, sorry, and then the white line, that's our interest on the excess reserves, right? So the Federal Reserve paying interest on excess reserves held at the Federal Reserve. Banks are not, are choosing to hold excess reserves rather than lending them out, despite the fact that the reward is greater for lending it out. What bank turns down money, right? So this is why I use that as evidence that it, I don't buy it. I think it's BS and calling bullshit on uh, it being a technical problem of three bad things happening all at the same time. Now, maybe it's just a weird little thing that, you know, the data, there's small variations in data. And I don't want to extrapolate too much here and say that's all going to be bad, but why would banks turn down free money and just participate? In the re, you know, in a market, why would they choose? Um, in this case, why are we looking at something where um, we are now close to exceeding what the target is? What this means? Here's the implications of what this is. Like. This is like when my son decided to ride his bike down the stairs right by the ski building that goes down to the thing. He said to ride his bike down, and he told me that it was really fun 
riding his bike down the stairs. Right? It was like bouncy and it was really fun riding it until he fell at the bottom, right? Because he lost control of the bicycle. That's exactly what this is. Um, this represents the Federal Reserve losing control now over these interest rates. So when I asked you what happened on Wednesday and you told me the Federal Reserve lowered the interest rate, we all kind of thought in the back of our head, well, if the Federal Reserve lowered the interest rate, then the interest rate must be lower, right? What this is suggesting is that the Federal Reserve is saying, we lowered the interest rate and the rest of the market's giving a big middle finger and saying, fuck that, we're gonna stay where we're at, right? I mean, that's what this is representing, is that and the Federal Reserve can say what it wants, but it's losing its firepower. It's losing its authority over the market to say, we will do what we have to do to keep it in the middle of the way. Because they've clearly demonstrated here that they've lost control. We're going too fast, or too slow, I guess. Um, right? But we're losing balance, um, whichever way you want to put it. Um, actually, in this case, it would be that we're going too fast. Um, so look at the bottom graph then. So now this is our spread, our interest rate spread um, here between our uh, interest rate on the excess reserves and the uh, federal funds rate. Going close to, right, it's getting close to, um, in this case, um, that I guess you could put this as a, um, that banks are deciding not to take on this. I guess is the way you could put it. Meaning they are turning down cash by not participating um, in the market in the overnight repurchase. Why are they not participating? Again, Federal Reserve will say they don't have the cash to do it. Maybe though, it's that the banks have the cash, they're just as choosing them not to do it that way, use it that way. Um, uh, um, so when I saw all this stuff happening, on Monday and Tuesday, it was just really hard. So I know I've <laughs> been deviating here from what I was supposed to do today, <laughs> but it was just hard for me to do today's lecture and ignore something that all of you lived for three days with not even knowing it happened. Um, and I suspect none of you even probably read a story about it um, in the three days that it happened, but it's pretty bad. Um, okay. Let's go to what we were going to do originally. Um, so there's a delay now. So the delay would be um, we're building up to you doing a economic outlook. So I want to show you this video first. It gives you an example of what one looks like. And these people, the Fed in Dallas, they did one unique to the state. You'll have options. You could do one for Hawaii. You could do one for the US, you could do one for the 12th district, which we are in. I don't care about what geographic region you use, but I wanna show you this so you have an example of what this looks like. What I'm gonna to provide to you is the uh, PowerPoint template of what you need to do. And I will at least make you a video that shows you how to use Fred to make the graphs that you need to make. If you choose to use a different geographic region, you don't have to worry about the data yourself. I can't, I mean, I'll help you if you really want to do it. Um, but my hope is that you'll just pick the US um, um, and make your life a little easier so you can use Fred. And then you're gonna use, the way that this is gonna look is that I will show you how to use Fred so you can manipulate the data. Then you're gonna export it to Excel or Google Sheets, create trend lines and make predictions about what the next quarter would be or what the next year would be. Either then by saying, I believe the trend lines or saying, I don't believe the trend lines. And the reason why I believe the trend line is this or the reason why I don't believe the trend line is this. Make sense, sort of? Let's look at this here. I'm not sure.
remember uh, this will at least be on the zoom video so even if you can't hear it that well just uh, oh actually i could add closed captions uh, so you can also read it too pretend it's like a foreign film um So basically, at this point, right, he's just providing a general introduction, setting the tone for either why he's going to consistently say, I think the trend lines are wrong, or why I think the trend lines are right. So, right, so you, this is where you have to do some kind of subjective sense, right? So, if this were just an objective project, meaning you just got the numbers, said here are the trend lines, this is what it's going to be, and this project isn't that interesting. What you're going to do is add the subjective to the trend lines and take your subjective information, meaning your assessment, and say, this is why, right? And you're saying like gut instinct, right? And nothing really more than that of why I think things are right or wrong. And so here, when he's talking about things like the oil markets and other things like that, he's using that information to say why he thinks the trend lines are right or wrong. So what you're going to see here, when we look at this chart as a whole, I'm not asking that you make this chart because, I mean, it might not be something you're going to be able to generate from Fred for what you're specifically looking for. But you'll notice there's a title. You're going to have some information where you don't exactly know what the information is because you're making the prediction, right? So you probably shade that in a different color because you don't know what it's going to be, right? And that's kind of the key part of your presentation is, Right, that number that you don't know what it's going to be because right, any two of you might not have the same prediction of what the number is going to be. Right, because one of you might believe the trend line, one of you might believe that the trend line is going to reach at 50%, and some of you might say, no way in hell, it's going to be the exact opposite. Um, but you have a title to the slide that doesn't make this a murder mystery. So you're kind of telling us, right, you're giving us a narrative, but you're also telling us with the title of the slide where you think you're going to go with this, right? So here it's going to be, right, in Texas, we are usually above the uh, nation. Our labor market is stronger in Texas than in the rest of the country. Man, Jacob, I should have worn my cowboy boots huh um yeah i'll wear them during presentation day yeah well, maybe i should do mine on um maybe i should do it on the oh, let's see. i'm gonna get better at using this here i have to keep going back this way okay so you have that idea um, I want to show you this one. This one was by my old boss at the Chicago Fed. Um, this is by Bill Strauss. There's no audio with this one, so you're just kind of watching. Um, you're just watching this. So this was my boss. And he's still there. Jeez, he must be a bajillion years old. Um, but again, I but I like what he's got here right because you've got as you're seeing these slides here and again i'm going to make this powerpoint available to you but you're basically seeing a title to the slide that's giving me an idea of what i'm looking for in the graph below it and then you're obviously narrating what's going on as well um and why you think the title is an accurate title um and that's kind of what you see here in this video right of someone getting a graph that demonstrates why they think the title is what it should be. 
Um, and all this data that we're seeing here, all this data that he's showing um, is all available on FLAD. So you could also use this video to kind of, I would suggest, you could use something like this video to kind of guide your own discussion. You could create the exact same data as, as Billy's creating here. And actually it doesn't go by Billy, but um, that Bill is creating here um, to create these same kind of things. So again, a graph in some sense is objective. Your subjective stance is in the title. Um, okay, I'm not gonna... And the idea is that, again, you're going to have this slide available too, so you can use that to guide. This one's far along. He's probably got like 30 slides here. We're not doing that um, kind of stuff. Oh, okay. do this. You'd think there's an easier way. I just don't know it. Okay. So now let's look at this. So when I'm looking at the template, um, I'm going to give you an idea of the big three that you need to do, right? GDP, inflation, unemployment. Um, I'm going to give you some idea of how far to go back in the data. But you see that green line? That green line would be something that you would generate with Excel or with SPSS or with Google Sheets, right? Getting some trend line information in the data so that you could say, dude, in those XXXXXX at the top, you'd say, the economy is performing a lot stronger than historically speaking, right? Because we can see that, right? It's well above the green line. Um, let's see here. You could if you want to. But you don't have to. You could just make Google do the work for you or Excel do the work for you, which does do regressions, but it also just would generate the, the trend line for you. Same here. Um, right? And here you see these yellow lines where, again, you're getting these kinds of estimates of where we think things might, where you think things might be, where you could tell that narrative. This green line here is not a trend line. This is the Federal Reserve's stated, calculated natural rate of unemployment that you all would have learned in 131 of 5%. So this isn't the trend line. This is the policy prescription of what it should be. And here you could make that XXX at the top be something like unemployment is lower than it should be historically speaking, which might place upward price pressure in the market. Uh, when I originally had this, um, it was something where students could like put the stars somewhere. I'm not going to make you do that kind of stuff. Um, it was something that <laughs> um, students could have used in like 131 or something like that. It's kind of a menial task of like, can you put the star at where we're at right now? I'm not making you do that kind of work. Um, okay, so let's see here. So here's our inflation. This green line is not a trend line. This is a stated Federal Reserve policy that we will have a 2% um, inflation target. So here you would say core inflation is actually in line, which is surprising because based on this previous graph, inflation should be higher than the green line, but yet it is at the green line. It's better than the problem we had a year ago though, where it was below the green line. So pick your poison. Okay. So so what my intent is, is that you're going to make, and again, I'm going to outline this a little bit further. It's just I ended up talking about the repo market too long today. And again, I don't want you doing this next week because there's no way I'm going to be able to grade something next week. Um, but what I'm going to do, and I'm not saying I'm going to do it by next week, but I'm going to make the video that tells you how to actually go into Fred and start doing this project, right? And you're going to basically make 
four to five to six slides. And you're going to make a two minute presentation where you basically are going to have a title to the slide. You're going to have the graph that you've manipulated and done what you've had to do in Fred. And you're going to give some narrative. So that the end result is again, something a little bit more, again, there's no audio to this, but I think your goal is going to be to have something a bit more like uh, slide number seven the presentation here. Um, and again, the reason why I included this here is because you can kind of use the narratives they use at the top of the slide um, to kind of help you guide it. And maybe I, I just couldn't find the right, you might be able to find Bill Strauss's uh, presentation on some other site where you actually would get the narrative. For some reason, this, um, you know, Rotary Club or whatever didn't include um, an audio to this. But um, I would say try to be more like slide seven's video than slide eight's video. But again, I'm going to make this all available to you. But at this point, I don't want you to leave class today thinking, oh, shit, I got to do this next week. Not yet. Um, just kind of getting us to that point. Um, again, I apologize. I spent too long talking about the repo market, but I at least can feel that, I don't know, each of these lectures cost you about 80 some dollars. So I can at least feel like you earned your, you spent your $80 well in tuition today. Uh, Cause at least you're leaving with some understanding of the repo market um, and an even deeper understanding of what made the 2008 financial crisis a financial crisis. Um, a sense of impending doom? Um, yeah, that's an excellent question. No, I don't. <laughs> I think I'm just a, I'm a pessimist by my own very nature. Um, I don't think, so the stock that really went down on, was it Tuesday? FedEx was down like, 20 percent i think 10 or 20 percent fedex was fdx um and it was down largely because they got rid of their amazon contract but also because people were like oh my god the economy's gonna slow down who's gonna send stuff next day air so right so the fedex play was this whole play on we think the economy is gonna fail soon or there's gonna be a recession soon um i still bought shares of fedex on tuesday so i'm not I think most economists at this point predict that the economy will slow down in 2020. I just, I think where economists are split is, is it going to be a 2001 or is it going to be a 2008? And again, I think that goes back to the repo market. Um, so what I would say is this, I'm always open to receiving new information. And if we had talked two weeks ago and you had said, Shredding. Is it going to be like a 2001 or a 2008? I would have told you it was going to be more like a 2001 because we had a lot of unicorns out there, a sign of a really hot tech market, um, too much money floating around out there. We just need a big correction, a regular 2001 kind of recession, which was a six month recession, pretty mild. Most of you were just born or just a baby. Um, I barely remember the 2001 recession because it really wasn't that bad. And it was very brief. Um, and, but I certainly remember the 2008 crisis. Um, but two weeks ago, if you would ask me, I would have said that 2020's recession was going to be a 2001 kind of recession. I'm saying there's at least now one more piece of evidence to suggest it might not be a 2001. I don't know if it'd be a 2008, but it might be like a 1998. So 1998 was an almost recession, but it was actually an almost financial crisis, um, which is when long-term capital management hedge fund failed and the Federal Reserve under Alan Greenspan bailed it out. But it represented a failure of the capital markets is what the 1998, uh, Pro session, I don't know, fake recession, right? Uh, free session. Um, the, the, the 1998 free session um, and the East Asian financial crisis of 97 um, represented capital markets eh, getting a little chilly. We wouldn't say they're frozen, but they were getting chilly. Um, this failure of the repo market is a piece of evidence that the Federal Reserve could get 
rid of the problem now and make it like a 98 almost recession or if they don't do what they're supposed to do which is kind of what's happening here that we're getting more evidence that the feds actually lost control of the market that it could be another 2008 instead of a 1998 and i don't know i guess we'll find out next year um what it's going to be um i'm kind of excited to find out what it's going to be but um I don't know. What do you think? I mean, are you I'm not pulling, more scared or less scared? I'm not pulling anything out of the market. It's... But when you came into this, okay, let me ask you this. Did you think there was going to be a, a recession soon? I kind you of. You know, like your, your I thought it was gut instinct. This year. Okay, that's fine. It was so good. Yeah. Um, okay. And did you think it was going to be more like 2001 or 2008? No, I thought it was going to be 2008. Hmm. So this is probably just reinforcing your thoughts then. My sense of impending doom, yes. Yeah, that, I mean, because again, if, I mean, if you think about what keeps me up at night, I mean, that's what keeps me up. Yeah. I mean. I didn't know anything about this, but just the interest rates and the unemployment and everything else just pointed to, and just what comes up must go down. Everything's been so high. Yeah, well, and again, what, right, everything has gone so high which is the same story of what you could tell in 2000 and mm -hmm. 2001 oh, is that i i know i've shown it in the other class but i still like always showing it because i just think it's the coolest thing ever to represent the um the pets.com mascot if anyone ever remembers what made the 2001 crisis or in 2001 that we had a, um, yeah, exactly. That the market was, that people were gonna buy dog food and get it shipped to them. Um, and there was a mascot that was a puppet. Now, ironically enough, this company has come back without the mascot. Uh, and you can actually buy it, uh, ticker symbol uh, CHWY, uh, Chewy. Oh, Chewy, yeah. yeah. Um, it's actually the same, business model same uh, same owners except they just don't have the mascot um chewy um they're actually doing well it is yeah no it is um yeah so um wow seeing that name pets.com is the greatest dot com disaster in history well but it was obviously oh well no it wasn't overtaken um so no, but you're right. I mean, if you look at, um, yeah, if you look at that chart, the question really will be what's going to happen next Thursday when I show you this chart, if I remember to show it to you. Um, it'll probably be, because now they're really going to be on top of it. It's probably going to be like, between two, two and a half percent. So everyone's gonna be like, oh, we got dodge that bullet. But that's exactly what people said in April of 2007 when they bailed out Bear Stearns, right? I mean. So if we look at it in December and they still haven't anticipated this people paying their taxes or corporations paying their taxes. Right, or, um, see the markets, when the market, in the financial crisis, when the dominoes are all falling, yes, you could blame all the dominoes having fallen because of the first domino, but is it really the first domino's fault? I mean, this is the first domino. But at some point, right, you could put your hand there and stop all the dominoes from falling, right? Which is what they did in 1998, right? When Greenspan bails out long-term capital management, a hedge fund, and the IMF bails out um, the East Asian countries like South Korea, Thailand, uh, Indonesia, uh, Myanmar, um, you know, all name your East Asian country that almost failed or did fail, and they almost all did in 1997. Um, you put your hand there and it stops it all, or you think you stopped it, like the Bear Stearns example. Right, you think you stopped it, but then in the process of moving your hand out of the way, 
you knock the next one down, right? Uh, which is what happened here, right? Because after Bear Stearns got bailed out and everyone said, we know what deal you're going to make now when we're going to fail. We want the exact same deal, which is why Layman, because then you must think, I mean, I hope you would have thought in the back of your head, why didn't Layman, knowing what they know in March, start to fix the problem, right? They had six months to fix the problem. Why didn't they do it? And in some sense, they didn't do it because, yeah, the Fed said we're not going to do it anymore. But you kind of knew the deal they were going to run for someone if they could. Exactly. You might as well just hope the market fixes itself and ever the optimist, let's just try to run it. So there is my question. What? Why didn't they just let it fix itself? Why didn't they let? I mean, that big economist, this is how things work. We leave it alone and it's going to correct itself. And yeah. If so, Stearns goes under. so if Bear Stearns had gone under, then the next weakest was Lehman. So Lehman would have failed probably shortly after that. Okay. Um, and of the seven investment banks, Goldman Sachs was the strongest. So it probably would have only been a few more days before Goldman fails. Um, at that point, the repo market is completely frozen. So it's going to spread over to the depository institutions which now means that the banks that you and I all deal with every day are also going to freeze out. Um, the treasury markets are going to be completely frozen because now there's no liquidity there, which now means that the entire financial market for the world is now going to fail because the most fail safe assets uh, besides Swiss bonds would be U S bonds. And um, now we're going to run on gold basically. Um, so, if you don't do it, it's a very, and, and so that was what happened in September, right? Is that that overriding philosophy of like, we told them you got to do it and you didn't do it. So now we're going to follow through on the threat, which is let's let the market find its equilibrium. The problem was AIG had written insurance contracts for Lehman failing, thinking that Lehman's never gonna fail. And then it did fail. And now AIG, if AIG wasn't as big as it was, we probably would have let AIG fail. But the problem was that AIG had hundreds of millions of dollars of insurance contracts and it was worldwide. Um, and it is what we would say, too big to fail um, because layman you could say it wasn't it was big but it could fail and we'd still live to see another same with um bear stearns that we would live to see another day if that bank if that investment bank failed and there's no investment bank that's critical anyone can anyone can fail but the problem is that this is like a i don't know what this is like this is like a um, I don't know, like marrying your sister. I don't know what this is like, but this is like, you know, everyone's in bed with everyone else is what I'm trying to say here, right? Is that, you know, it's not like one fails independently and that one domino falls and none of the rest are affected. They're all intimately connected with each other. Um, they're all ensuring the risk against each other. So one goes down, they all go down. Um, yeah, and the uh, um, problem, as you identify, though, is that the market has no discipline because AIG was bailed out. So the only thing that's now managing the market and making that the situation is because banks since 2008 have to endure stress tests. So stress tests, they have to do stress tests uh, twice a year, I think, three times a year. And what a stress test does is it simulates a financial crisis or a recession happening and saying, would you as a bank live to see another day if Goldman Sachs failed? If there was a 1% contraction in, right? So it's kind of like saying, is that your sister in bed with you, right? So like, we're trying to figure out like, what's going on here, right? Like, how connected are you with everyone else? 
and sorry with that extreme. I mean, it's an extreme example. I don't know why I picked it. Um, it. Yeah, but I'm trying to use an extreme example too, so it's really sticking in your head here. Of like, I mean, what a stress test does is can your institution survive the theoretical stresses that could be imposed on you? And if it can't, the Federal Reserve is required to tell everybody you didn't pass the test. And if the Federal Reserve says to everyone, Goldman Sachs didn't pass the test, who's going to want to do business with Goldman Sachs? So the fear, and you're seeing that fear here is, fuck, I better hold more than just what I absolutely have to. And look at that's where you see it happening, right? End of 2008, 2009, which is when the stress tests start coming in. Also, what happened under Dodd-Frank, which was the law that basically was the reaction to the financial crisis was um, depository banks can't participate in the repo market to the extent that they used to be able to, which is another reason why the repo market's a little odd. So investment banks are participating in it more than depository institutions. The reason being, if the repo market fails, we don't want it spreading to Banco and First Hawaiian, right? Like who cares if rich people lose money? Um, more costly for the rest of us too. So that's another reason for why these reserves are so high is because of the stress tests, which are making banks be more cautious than they otherwise would be. Which is obviously filtering into this. So the question is, are the stress tests uh, good enough? Are they actually accurate? Um, we don't know because we've actually never tested them against a real world event. They're just theoretical trend lines in Google Sheets. So we don't really know. We think we know what would happen, but if you had said to someone- The economists are always wrong. Yeah, but if you, had, and so part of this is, if you had told someone in the week that Lehman failed, no one knew that by Lehman failing, it was gonna affect the AIG. We knew that AIG had a bad balance sheet, but we didn't think Lehman failing would affect AIG, which is why the Fed just said, let Lehman fail, it's so small, who gives a fuck? Um, but then it failed and the AIG was like, fuck, we have all their stuff, right? And that's when they finally told the Fed, the Fed's like, dude, you didn't tell us that them failing was gonna affect you. If we'd known that, we would have saved Lehman. Now we gotta save you. Um, yeah, and that's fast forward 11 years and here we are. Yeah, okay. Um, so uh, what that means is that next week, um, we'll see what the news is that's telling us. Hopefully I'm not gonna go on a hour and a half rant about the repo markets. Um, and they can actually get to um, more Fred data, uh, hopefully. Um, but hopefully you don't feel like your tuition dollars are wasted today. So, okay, um, I will pick it up from there um, on next week, Thursday. <laughs> well, it's not going to be till middle of October. Yeah, don't. I'm not. Not even at that point yet of worrying about that. Yeah, you're not going to do it until for a bit. Yeah. Why are you worried about it? You do seem to worry about everything. You do seem to worry about. <laughs> Okay, so I don't know. I worry, but what's it gonna do? You know? Something that you mentioned that the rest is on my mind. You what? Oh man, see, yeah. me and my friend are gonna go check out uh, Texas Carbon Island. You're gonna what? <coughs> check out uh, Whiskey Dicks. Oh, <laughs> yeah, the line dancing. Damn, yeah. it's a pretty three dollar mixture. And how late does this bar open till? One. Yep. Who's that? Oh, I'm gonna stop my recording. Okay. Yeah. So when are you going? Right now. It opens at eight.